evening or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Adam Lieber, I'm just gonna talk, I tend to uh, title a lot of my talks kind of old, like old uh, Rocky Bullwinkle, Rocky and Bullwinkle uh, things. So I have my main title and, you know, or why my garden die. Uh, let me figure out how I can get this to change. Make sure I get in the right spot. Um, so first, when we talk about diseases, uh, it, it's really important to kind of separate um, what we're talking about. Um, when you're talking about diseases, you really want to make sure that you separate um, your, your non-infectious diseases, so you're really more of your disorders, uh, from your actual infectious diseases. So these are, so the, the disorders are things like chemicals, any chemical applications, that, misapplications, uh, anything that happens from the environment, you know, any genetic mutation, mechanical, anything that's going to ha happen to that plant. Um, typically there, you, you're not, you're, those disorders are not going to happen. You're not going to see it spreading over time. So it's going to happen at a single, kind of almost a single episodic, single point in time, the damage occurred. Uh, and then you, and then we go from there. Uh, compared to infectious diseases, um, these are going to be uh, caused by pathogens. Um, they're going to progress over time, uh, and they're, and more and this is important. They're going to be able to spread from plant to plant. Um, you know, you're not going to have a freeze damage, and you know it might be widespread, but it's not spreading from one plant to another. It's it's once that happens, it, you know, once that freeze event's over, the damage is done. Compared to, you know, um, dis a disease where it can, might progress from year to year every single year from plant to plant. Um, when we're talking about diseases, um, the, the, what we're actually talking there is, is, is it's something that's uh, a, a pathogen or pest has actually caused some damage disrupting the natural process. Uh, the only way that you're gonna have that actual disease is if you have, uh, this is what we call the disease triangle. Um, you need all three susceptible hosts, the right environment and the pathogen to be present at the same time for, uh, for the host, for the disease to happen. Um, you know, if you have the host and the pathogen, but not the right environment, there's not gonna be a problem. Uh, if you have the, the right environment and the host, uh, but no pathogen, the pathogen is missing, you're not gonna have a problem. The only time you're gonna have a problem on this little triplet uh, Venn diagram is right there in that middle where it says problem, that white line, white section. Um, that's gonna be the only time you're gonna have diseases. If we, when you have all three of these, um, things to happen at the same time. So when we're talking about diseases, it's really more about uh, disease management, uh, problem management. Uh, and regardless of what uh, different takes you want to do about it, I really recommend taking a, an integrated pest management approach to all this. Uh, the main thing here, um, this similar to the old uh, uh, food, food pyramid, nutritional pyramid, you're supposed to, it's ideally you want to wait, start at the bottom and work your way up. The most effective disease management is going to always be working your way from the bottom to the top. So ideally you want to, you know, do the prevention first. It's always easier to prevent that disease. Uh, you know, ounce of prevention is, is worth a pound of cure. Um, you know, doing all your cultural and sanitation uh, methods next, physical, any physical barriers me uh, methods. And finally at that very top is that chemical thing. That really should be the last line of defense for any kind of any problem that we're dealing with. Uh, when we're talking about preventative, um, this, one of the ways we can talk about this is to be doing crop rotation. Um, that's gonna be, kind, it's kind of a, it, some of these areas and uh, uh, categories are kind of blurry at times. You know, crop, crop rotation is a little bit of preventative because you're moving the garden every two or three years. Um, you know, variety selection. So choosing, if you know you've had um, this here, this little corner of the, uh, is a corner of our website um, for Pink Girl Tomatoes. Um, if you know you've had, uh, let's say, alternaria stem blight here, um, I don't know, where's my, yeah, please point. So this, these little codes down here all are indicating for different diseases. So you can see this is IR, it's usually have, we'll have an IR, MR, it's, and there'll be, there should be a key somewhere on the website. If not, it's a poorly designed website. And, you know, at that point, you can either go find a different website or a different catalog or call them up or something. Um, if you know you've had alternary stem blight, you know, here's the, our alternary stem blight AAL. Um, that's what, that's the code that this company is using. Um, and you can, you can find the diseases, uh, varieties that have specific uh, resistance to those diseases. That way, even if you, 
it's kind of like taking out the that's uh, similar to taking out the host because now your your host the tomatoes that you're planted are less susceptible less of a susceptible host to those diseases so even if you have the disease the pathogen and the environment your disease, your host is less susceptible to get this so it's kind of preventing that disease there we need to um, another big thing to do for prevention is, is to, san to kind of do some garden sanitation. We're not talking about going out with a scrub bucket with soap and water, uh, any with anything like that. It's really more about making sure that we are trying to keep the disease out. So starting off with uh, disease-free uh, seeds, or if you're saving seeds from year to year, um, you can do some heat treatments. Some, um, I know, especially with the advent of some of the cheaper sous vide units, it's made it a lot easier to do the heat treatments because um, you can get a very stable temperature bath, hot water temperature bath, um, compared to trying to do it on the stove. It's a little trickier. Um, so you could, there are treatments that, to do for if you're trying to save seed to get rid of those pathogens on it. Uh, if you're start making, if you're uh, growing your own transplants and starts, you want to make sure that you're starting off with clean pots, uh, flat stakes shovels, boots, everything it should be scrubbed down over any soil and then and sanitized with a 10% bleach solution or some other sanitizer. So you know, if you get it cleaned and it's a hard surface, you can use 10% bleach, you can use alcohol, you can do any of the other sanitizers that are usually general, any of the household sanitizers should work. Um, if you're doing your shovels or tools with bleach, make sure that you rinse them off well afterwards and re-oil them just to make sure that they don't rust. Um, as far as stakes go, um, it's similar to in, in your um, at home. You wouldn't want to put. Uh, you're not supposed. To, you don't cut raw meat onto wood because it's porous. You're never going to get it completely clean and sanitized. Ideally, uh, wooden stakes aren't always the best option. It, something like this, where the disease, the plant is dying. These stakes, I would recommend. These wooden stakes in between, I would recommend discarding those. You're never going to be able to completely sanitize them. Uh, and it's always going to be a risk. Um, likewise, metal T post, you really want to try to keep those in good working order. Um, painting them on an on occasional basis to keep that co coat or either prevent that rust or uh, at least encapsulate that rust so it's not a port, like a hard porous thing that's going to, that's going to trap dirt from, se from season to season. So th these are the kind of things to kind of think about when you're reusing this is making sure that you get all that, as much of that dirt and soil off especially if, if it's been around diseased plants and then sanitizing that beforehand. That's gonna keep, help prevent uh, your diseases from going on from one plant to another, from one year to the other. Um, like I said before about rotation, mulching, um, the reason we wanna rotate them, at, uh, our, a lot of diseases, our, our garden around, um, most of our plant, a lot of our plant pathogens overwinter, spend the winter in the soil and, and plant debris or in the soil itself. So when you move those plants to a new location, you're actually moving your, your plants away from where that most of that disease, those, spore, those fungal disease spores, bacterial spore uh, cells are. So that way it can't, there, there's gonna be a little harder for them, those pathogens to find, get to that host. Um, likewise, applying a mulch around it, uh, it creates that barrier, a physical barrier between that soil and the pathogens that are in the soil from splashing up onto it, especially if it's during any kind of irrigation or rain events that can really spread that around. Um, and if you were with the, with, if you were here when I was talking about, uh, you know, starting vegetable diseases, this will look a little different, a little similar. Uh, this is just kind of a quick example of a simple um, a rotation. You really want to do at least three years. If you can do more, more rotate it for more years around, that's even better. Um, this is just kind of a standard uh, tomato, uh, uh, rotational schedule. We've got them grouped here as in different colors based on their families. So tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, potatoes, these are all in the solanaceous family. Um, you'd wanna group those and move those together ideally. Um, your legumes, the, pe the beans and peas, um, those are in another group. Uh, squashes, so that's just anything from zucchini to pumpkins to, to watermelons. Ideally kind of moving those together. Corn is a grass, so it's, it's kind of a whole different area. And then any of your herbs. Um, Oh, I guess I changed it. Herbs, onions, whichever. Um, so really the thing there is you're, you're rotating it from one spot to another. Your tomatoes and peppers were here before. We've moved them over um, to, the, to the center section. And then the third year, now you're, you've, you've moved your tomatoes and peppers 
are all the way to the end and you're kind of it's kind of circling through. So the next year would be year, year A and the, the tomatoes and peppers would be back over here on the left side. Uh, as far as irrigation, how we irrigate and how we water our, our plants can really play a big effect on uh, how well, uh, on how our diseases come about as well. Uh, the big thing here is that we're trying, um, like most organisms, like, like all, all living life, they need water to live. Um, pathogens really need uh, free water sitting on top of the plant surface, plant leaf to infect. So if by keeping that foliage as dry as possible, trying to minimize how often that fol uh, foliage gets wet, um, we can try to help lower the incidence of the disease, how, how often it's going to get infected. So really want to avoid any overhead watering. Um, if you can, use soaker hoses and drip tapes. They're much better at it. Um, if you do have to, if you are, don't have the option of using soaker hoses, drip tapes, uh, you can you can hand water. You, you just want to make sure I do, you can uh, either go in with a hose and either uh, water at the base of the plant. Um, that way you're you're trying to minimize the soil splashing up onto it, and also um, the amount of time that that uh, that you know not getting that foliage wet. Um, if your only option is again to use an overhead sprinkler, um, it's not the end of the world. You can use the overhead sprinkler. I would suggest putting on a hose timer. Uh, and trying to get that timer to turn on early in the morning, five, six, five to seven o'clock or even earlier. Uh, that can actually help the plant dry out some, especially if you're in a very moist, humid area. If you're uh, down in a, in a valley or a ravine um, where you get a lot of uh, fog and everything, that, wa that, those, that really early morning uh, overhead watering can actually knock the dew off the plant. And allow it to dry out quicker the next next year. Uh, and then once the sun comes up, um, that's really the better way to do it. That way, if you have to water overhead, you're at least not adding. It's not the plant's already wet, so you're just kind of helping dry it out further. Um, you do still have the issue with it with using those that you're going to potentially have more soil splashing. So if that is your only option, I would definitely recommend to do a a, a good a good mulch layer on the ground. Other ways that uh, deal with the, some some uh, our different diseases, insects. Um, this is still kind of some of our holdover from from in, from when I talk about insects as well. Um, but if you can try to consider any planting or transplanting times, um, this can sometimes depending on the weather and everything, you can kind of get around um, different insect and disease pressures. Um, sweet corn, specifically, it's, you know, some of the, the insects are a little easier just because we have their specific degree days. Sweet corn, you can plant early to avoid uh, late season earworms. Vining crops, you can delay it to avoid some of the, the mass, a larger grouping of cucumber beetles. Other things, uh, cultural, and again, this is where we kind of start getting into that, where is that line between cultural and mechanical controls? Um, in all practical reality, it doesn't really make a big sense unless you're teaching a class on it. Uh, you know, maximize, the big thing here is that you're trying to You've got the plants in the ground. You're trying to make sure that you create an uh, uh, an unfavorable environment for it. So, uh, like I said before about the, the the irrigation, they really like that free moisture. So anything you do to try to encourage that uh, plant to dry out you, by maximizing the air movement around those plants. So if you know you've had a lot of tomato tomato foliar diseases, uh, making sure that you spread them out, uh, pro give them provide proper spacing for it, or even give them a little extra spacing than what they even say. Uh, trellising them up off the ground so that way more air can flow through it, pruning them up so that way you kind of create a thinner canopy under on the close to the ground, put more of that foliage up the top. Um, that's what's going on here. My, there, here. Here is actually an example of mine. These are here's a row, uh, almost a hedgerow of, um, these are some cherry tomatoes that came up. Um, volunteers, I just kind of let them grow. But they were on the ground, had a lot more disease issues, a lot more foliage diseases, um, a lot harder to pick too. And the fruit comes out cleaner compared to putting them up in cages. Um, the, the bottom, I typically would prune to the first on tomatoes, I'd prune the leaves and any suckers up to the first flower, uh, flower axle. So when the first flower comes in, then let them go kind of go up from there. Um, even at this point, you have some like these tomato, these cherry tomatoes. They're gonna get. They're gonna be voracious. They're gonna be trying to take up every space you can. You can actually prune some of these back. Um, if you keep up on it, you can kind of keep them a little bit more contained, and you're still gonna get lots of production from it. You're just gonna keep them a little bit more bushier on top, 
uh, without them, you know, spilling over and, you know, always battling to keep them from dro uh, dropping down. Um, other benefit of trellising them is the fact that you don't have to definitely always bend, you know, you're not on your hands and knees picking, picking tomatoes. Uh, and then if they're on the ground, they're more likely to rot, from either slugs eating them, other things getting in there, or just diseases, uh, you know, being constantly wet and just molding them out. So that's one of the big things. Uh, managing your weeds and volunteers. Um, here I have a bunch of grass clippings under it, straw works, uh, you can use wood chips. I would do anything that, any kind of um, plant bait or any kind of material that's gonna break down over time, any, any carbon-based natural material that's gonna break down. Um, that way, it, as you're rotating it, you can either till that, that, that into the soil and it's adding organic matter to, the, to your soil and help feeding it over time. Um, and that, and that way it's, it, and as you move it from rotate your garden, you don't have to try to move any kind of uh, synthetic mulch around and store it and, every, and clean it, everything. Um, you wanna make sure you also are managing any weeds and volunteers with it. Um, obviously this is not the best location. These were, you know, this is where I grew tomatoes last year. I had a lot of disease issues and you can, I was able to even see, you know, these first row right next to it had worse disease issues than the ones in the second row over even. So it was just one of those things that it kind of got away from me. I let it go just to see what would happen. Um, it's always good for you know plant pathologists to have photos of some, some what not to do as well. Um, this bottom photo here, this is just an alternator leaf blot. You can see all this chickweed growing around this cabbage. Um, that's gonna create a, when you keep those weeds, especially on the lower crops like this, when you keep heavy weeds around it, that is not only competing and sucking up water and fertilizer and competing directly with it, um, but it's also going to hold moisture up against it, leave, keeping it from drying out as much. Um, and then, you know, before you start planting, you're really making sure that your soil is adequately drained. Um, this is something that you really should need to do before you start planting, but this is more important for uh, your, any of your, your, your root diseases. Um, there's not a lot of, unfortunately, there's not a lot of biological controls for, for diseases. Um, uh, these are typically, a lot of times when you see the biological controls, these are going to be more like, in at least for the home garden thing, this is going to be like planting flowers to encourage more beneficial insects or purchasing in beneficial insects to, to help uh, pre predate onto pest diseases. That's more of our biological controls. We don't really have that for, for diseases. Um, so it's kind of, unfortunately, it's one of those things we kind of skip over. Um, for chemical management, um, the big thing with any chemical management is, you know, first trying to control and prevent it through all things else. Um, but you really want to make sure that you get a proper diagnosis of the disease. Um, something like this tomato, these strawberries here, it, you know, at this, at this stage, if you're finding disease at this point, it doesn't do a whole lot of good, to, you know, making sure you get that proper diagnosis, uh, knowing that, you know, at this point, uh, this is going to be a little late to be doing any sprays. So, you could spray it, but it's not going to do any good. Um, it really is going to be more about you know cleaning up and and, cl and taking those those uh, infected strawberries out of the bed, so that way it's not going to be there. So you really want to make sure that you are making getting a proper diagnosis of this disease, so whether or not you are familiar with the disease uh, and knowing roughly what it should be, or if you're not sure, um, asking, uh, talking with your county extension agent, um, talking with your local nurseries. Uh, other master, if you know any uh, extension master gardeners, that they can either help you or at least get you in touch with the with the extension service, uh, get it to a diagnostic lab. That way, we can get a proper diagnosis on that plant and make sure that you're actually putting any any chemicals that you're putting on for that control are going to actually going to be effective. Um, when you're talking about chemical management, you want to make sure that you always read and follow those labels. Um, I know, I don't know how many times I've showed up to home, homeowners before and they start asking questions about whether they can apply certain, you know, fungicides or whatever. And I'm the first one that has opened up this little booklet on the back. This is something that I've always done. You should actually be doing, re opening this up and double checking this really before you purchase the material. So always re make sure you read and follow those labels. They'll have directions on how to, uh, what, it, what this, the chemical is actually gonna uh, control um, if it, what timing and application rates you're going to put, put it on at, um, how soon, how, how much time you need to apply and how much time you need to wait between application and harvest is important too. That way the natural breakdown of these, these fungicides and insecticides, uh, is, can, can diminish, uh, with enough time, natural, naturally break down over time 
be a, to a safe level. Uh, and this goes for both conventional and organic ones. Um, they're both pesticides, they're both toxic, uh, regardless of what, whether or not they're OMRI listed. So you, you wanna make sure that you're treating them all with, with proper, proper respect. Um, even if it is a natural fungicide, just remember um, snake venom is, is natural too, and it's just as toxic. Uh, so just make sure you're doing that. Um, these labels are also tell you about any pr pr appropriate prote personal protective equipment. You should always wear, be wearing closed toe shoes, long pants, long shirt, long sleeve shirt, uh, gloves, uh, especially when you're mixing. And um, if not goggles, at least get, get a decent pair of, of well-fitted um, safety glasses to keep any splashes off your eyes. Um, if it's a dust or a fine powder, you want to make sure that you're wearing a properly rated dust, a dust uh, properly rated dust respirator. Um, no dust is good to breathe in no matter where what the source is. Um, so if you're looking for actual chemical recommendations, this is where looking for at extension, talking to the extension agent, um, looking at uh, extension uh, publications um, that, a, a, or taking it to send it to a diagnostic lab for their reports back from it too. Um, you can find a lot of other information online um, but it's sometimes kind of iffy, you know, how, what the source is, how, how management is it. If you go to a, a land grant university's extension service, um, UK, KSU, whatever your, your state's local place is, we're not trying to sell you on anything. So we have no skin in the game with whether or not you purchase and buy this material from us. We're not selling you anything. So uh, we're just trying to provide you with the best, uh, the most effective information we can. Um, so just uh, kind of review the overall general good practices for disease management. Um, big things, crop rotation, whether this is within a, a single large bed or from raised bed to raised bed. You can even do this within a single raised bed, smaller area, just even moving it from one side of the garden to the other. Uh, one side of the bed to the other will give you some benefits. Um, choose resistant varieties. You know, make sure you're, you're trying to create the disease-free seeds, start with healthy plants. Uh, don't over fertilize, don't under fertilize. Um, you know, if you need to, if you, if you know you've had issues, it's good to have a soil test. Um, all of our, I know in UK, at Kentucky, all of our, you can have your soil tested for a fairly a reasonable rates here in, in all your counties. Um, mulching is a huge thing. Um, I still think mulch is probably your biggest, one of the biggest best tools that gardeners have, whether it's in the vegetable garden, in your flower gardens, around your trees. Uh, mulch is always a great thing. It's going to feed you. It's going to help. It provides more benefits than the effort that you're putting into it. Um, so then, at the back of the end of the season, just kind of make sure that you're cleaning up the cleaning up at the end of the season anything that was diseased. Make any notes um, that way you know from year to year. Um, just a little, and we'll go over a little now a little uh, some of the specifics about common diseases that we're going to come. You're likely to see out in the, out there in the garden. Um, so the first off would be our solanaceous crops. These are our tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, potatoes. Um, this, if you've grown tomatoes, some of these should look familiar. Um, the most common one that you're almost guaranteed to see every single year, uh, whether or not you've grown tomatoes this year or not, they grow, uh, is gonna be these leaf blights, typically se either septorial leaf blight, early leaf blight. Um, these are both very common. They, they move pretty, not only where they splash up from the, from the uh, uh, from the soil, that's where most of the infection comes from. If it's a new garden site and you get it, um, it likely came in on a storm, on some heavy winds or heavy storms, so that wind blown rain can move this quite a distance. Um, the, you know, the septoria leaf blight tends to have smaller leaf spots in it, darker circles around it. Uh, the, the early leaf, early blight, you know, it, it, they start off small, but they start, the, the lesions start getting larger. You usually see that's the concentric greening behind, underneath it. Um, they start, because they're soil-borne diseases, they typically start at the bottom of the, the plant and kind of work their way up there. So as you're looking at these, you can remove those infected leaves, especially early in the season. Um, that'll help slow that disease down. Again, this is more about problem management and not problem elimination. Uh, most of your disease management issues is more about slowing down the disease progress, either preventing the disease or slowing that disease progress to the point that you get most of your harvest. Um, from a tomato leaf to blight issue, in all honesty, as far as if you have this, either one of these two, it really doesn't make a big, huge difference which one you have. Um, it's kind of, at that point, it's more of an academic whether or not you have septorial leaf blight, early leaf blight. Um, it's going to, the, the treatments typically are the same. 
the sanitation, uh, cleaning them off using re resistant varieties. Uh, the chemical controls are the same, both typically a copper fungicide of some sort or, chlor or chlorothalonil um, if you're having strong issues with it. Um, late blight is a bit more of a uh, more serious issue. Um, this can sit in the soil for a good number of years uh, between things. Um, luckily for us, it usually isn't an issue. Uh, it, they're typically infected, plants are typically infected as, as seedlings. Um, you know, I think it was the last, I can't remember the last big outbreak. I want to say 2009 was the last one I can remember, uh, where there was a lot of seedlings. There was an infection outbreak in Florida where a lot of the transplants were moved up and then they went all to the big box stores and it got spread around everywhere. Um, late blight, this is the same late blight that infects uh, potatoes as well, causes potato, the, the Irish potato famine. It will infect all parts of the plant. So the roots, the stem, the leaf, the fruit. Uh, it's a darker lesion, a lot more diffuse on the leaf. So it's not as very uh, defined edges of this lesion. On the fruit, you get more of kind of a greasy, dark spot splotching on it. It's not really a soft spot, so they still stay firm. It's just kind of this dark, greasy bit of it before it, until it finally dies. Uh, and then same with the stem, it's kind of a dark lesion on the, on the limb. It's, they, they can get sometimes difficult to, sit, to, to actually spot. Uh, luckily, late blight is not very common around here. Um, our, our bacterial diseases, this is where it kind of might get a bit more of a, uh, important to try to figure out which one we have as far as diseases go on our, le our, our, our tomatoes, uh, this bacterial leaf spot. Um, it can look similar to our uh, septoria, septoria leaf spot. But the, the, the spots on them are, are not typically round. They're a bit more kind of angular, squarish, kind of defined by the different leaf, leaf margins, the leaf veins themselves. Um, the, the, but the, most of your garden sanitation, rotation, the cultural controls are, on, are gonna kind of be the same for all of these. Um, the biggest difference between, you know, like the bacterial leaf spot or the spec is that, you know, the spec is going, spec spot and canker on this can all infect the fruit. Um, Again, it's not usually a big issue. It's a bit more, usually a bit, these are a little bit more seed borne. So as long as you're choosing correct seed source and uh, it's, it's gonna be less of an issue. Again, bacterial leaf spot here, you can see it's similar to that tomato spot disease, bacterial disease. You can see that the spots are a little bit more angular, a little bit less, they're not really round as much as there's some clear defined straight lines on it. Um, this is again, a lot of times, uh, seed borne, so it's gonna come in from, from infected seeds, or if that you have it, had it in the past year and you put seedlings, young transplants in there at the same time from the year before, it could get onto those as well. Uh, and thracnose uh, is a fungal disease, uh, typically you know, keeping it it's when it gets too wet or there's other stresses on it. Uh, again, that Phytophthora blight, this is similar to your late blight, it's a different species, but it's, gonna, it's attacking in the roots. And so your plant's gonna look like they're wilted no matter how much water you give them. Um, this is more of a root, root rot issues, more, don't see this very often, but if it's, if you have well-drained soils, uh, it's more of an issue if you get, you know, the same disease coming in in the same, sitting in the soil, or um, it's the water, the ground is too soggy. Viruses are hard to, are, are hard to determine. Um, they do weird things to plants. So you get everything from uh, they'll be asymptomatic and not show any symptoms. They'll show some like this leaf modeling. They'll do some distortion, like almost similar to herbicide damage. Uh, again, it, it, they're a little tricky to determine. They're not as common as they uh, it, uh, very often. And typically with the viruses, they'll continue to fruit and produce uh, fruit as well. Um, so again, pruning the suckers up to that first flower, keeping it spacing wider, um, again, mulching, Cleaning, cleaning everything too. If you are, especially the sanitized cages, if you're using old cages um, from year to year, make sure that you're cleaning and sanitizing them. Because um, if you have, if there's still you know fungal spores sitting on it, as soon as the, the plant grows up to it, it's going to be up higher in the canopy just from that standpoint. Again, making sure that your water. Uh, if you're trying to, if you know you've had issues in the past. Um, Common fungicides there would be something like chlorothalonil that's often sold as daconil, mancozeb, sulfur, sulfur or copper fungicides can be applied every seven to 10 days. Um, if it's a bacterial disease that you found, only that copper is gonna be, uh, gonna be effective. Um, and I'll honestly, if you're doing most of these other things, 
uh, it's going to be an extreme example that you really need to be doing this, the, 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 the fungicides every single year on uh, starting off with it. Um, I know I've, I don't think I've ever, so far in a backyard garden, I have not seen a condition where I would think that it was warranted that you couldn't get, that they weren't doing, you, mo I could attribute most of the diseases to, to them not doing some of the other cultural controls, either cleaning or something else like that. Uh, as far as the cucurbit crops, these are our cucumbers and squash, the zucchini. Uh, <clears throat> issues here are, are going to be things like powdery mildew. Um, this is just going to be kind of a fuzzy, whitish gray um, uh, fungal mass on it. Um, doesn't, you know, on, by itself is typically not going to cause a major issue. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something to keep an eye out for. And thracnose, on the other hand, uh, if you start seeing these kind of these brown angular, brown dry spots on your leaves, it can also start infecting um, our, our fruit as well. And this is where it starts becoming really more of an issue is when you start getting those fruit rots on it. Again, fusarium fruit rot is, is, is not uncommon. Um, alternary leaf blight, you get some other, other little spots here. This is similar to the early blight is gonna have kind of some concentric rings. Uh, gummy, gummy stem blight on your, your uh, I think this is on cucumber. Um, you can kind of see some, oh, where my hair is. You, there's some, some along this stem right here, there's some darker red lesions that are kind of getting, you know, letting out plant, like a gummy plant sap, sap on that. Uh, damping off is a, is, a, is a fairly common one. Uh, usually you see this only with seedlings. Uh, once they get a full true, uh, full size, true leaf on it, it's less of an issue. Um, really the fungus, there's a fungus, uh, several different fungi that can uh, come along and attack the, the new seedlings right at the soil surface. Um, big thing is there is just making sure that you're getting your plant started off in the right thing in the right environment. Um, downy mildew can be a huge issue. Um, luckily for us, it doesn't overwinter here. Um, so it usually we actually have a network, a nationwide network of, of uh, land grant universities uh, and, and pathologists that are actually track it as it moves from the south, uh, where they you know have year-round production, Texas, Florida, stuff like that. Uh, they can actually see the they'll, they'll actually track the progression of it and have sentinel plots tracking this disease as it moves up every year. Um, you know, they're always kind of hoping that we can try to keep push, slow it down as much as possible, so that way people get harvest off beforehand. Um, there is some people doing some research um, with there being more greenhouses up in Michigan, Canada, um, there has been starting to see some outbreaks kind of moving from those greenhouses back down south too. Um, but we'll, we'll see about this. Um, climate with, with climate change getting a little bit, our, our winters and everything, summer's getting warmer. Um, it wouldn't be unheard of to start seeing this show, start showing up a little sooner in the season. Um, and it might start becoming a bigger issue for us. Uh, again, uh, this is some of our water molds. So these are just fungi. These are fungal-like organisms. Um, they act a lot like like fungi do, but they really need uh, almost free soggy water, free water, even more free water than than the fungi do. Um, big thing here again, like all the other other ones, is to make sure that you are providing enough um, air movement, trying to get it as dry as possible. Uh, Phytophthora blight is going to be a bigger issue. Uh, it's going to spread a little quicker. Uh, and go, start going on to the leaves. Um, on your zucchini and yellow squash, this is conifera rot. It's typically going to start, always going to start infecting at the blossom end of the flower. It's actually infecting this uh, flower as it starts fading and takes that as an entry point to, into the fruit itself. So it's always going to, it's always going to be from this blossom ends moving up. It'll get really fuzzy. Um, big thing there is when you see it, uh, that's where you practice a bit of sanitation prune those back out, get rid of those, and get those out of the garden as soon as you start to see them. Um, that way you can try to limit the fungal spores coming back into it. Uh, bacterial diseases, bacterial wilt is a huge issue. Um, this is uh, a bacterial disease that's being vectored and being moved and spread by the cucumber, the cucumber beetle, uh, both striped and spotted. Um, if you, can, you can actually see, if you get them to the point of that they're wilting, if you cut that stem, you can actually start seeing this kind of, this is actually a knife point on a, um, this, this right here is a knife point uh, and a cut stem. And there is some kind of oozy, stringy 
sticky kind of sap coming out of it. That's the actual bacteria that are living in that, vas that the vascular system and stopping the water from moving through it. Um, so because this is being moved by that, that cucumber beetle, if you can um, cover your cucumbers uh, with some like lightweight row covers, at least until it starts flowering, uh, put that back as, as long as pop, put peat and cover as long as you can um, up until flowering. That's going to help limit your, uh, your exposure to it and, and allow you to get a better crop, especially later in the season. If you do a successive crop, so if you're putting it, you're starting more than one set of seeds, netting over top of those, that, those new seedlings before, uh, up until they start flowering. That way they have a chance to, to be able to grow without being exposed to those bacterial, the, the, the cucumber beetle and the bacteria as well. Um, other things is getting rid of any other, other um, weeds around it. Cucumber beetle has a wide host range, so it feeds on a lot of different plants. So trying to get those extra weeds out of there as much as possible. Um, angular leaf spots. Uh, again, sanitation is a big thing here. Uh, it kind of, usually to me, it looks like the, uh, a heavy storm, uh, hail storms come through and it just, you get these kind of what we call shot hole. So the, the, the center of the, the infected leaf, instead of having, you know, brown or tan, they, they fall out. So it looks like it's tattered. Uh, again, these are, the big thing here is to start starting off with clean seed, uh, making sure that you're rotating uh, plants around. There's not a lot of any much effective sprays for it. Um, again, other than trying to push back that disease till, till later in the season. Um, cucumbers and anything else, you know, preventing that fruit from coming in contact. Because really, the, I, we're less concerned about the leaves being infected as long as they have enough, uh, you know, enough area to make photosynthesis and get enough sugars into the fruit. We're really more worried about the fruit being infected and rotting out. Um, there's a lot of water there, and they get they start rotting, they go down quick. Uh, so either placing them on placing mulch under it if you've got a larger, you know, winter squash uh, cucumbers, even placing a couple of boards, getting them off the soil surface uh, to allow that. Um, if you have smaller melons, smaller squash, winter squash, uh, cucumbers, putting them up on a trellis works really well too. Again, don't let, try to avoid getting those leaves wet. Those are big, that's a lot of surface area to dry off. So, and with a little leaf, but cucumbers and, and squash have a lot of little hairs on them. So it takes a lot of time for that, all that hair, all the water to get off that, in between those hairs. Um, if you've got, if you, if you've gone through all these other things to try to manage it and still having issues, um, copper is an effective one for both the, the for a lot of these issues, um, especially for the bacterial, it, um, for, for our other things, it's copper is not going to be effective on the bacterial wilt, like I said before, with the cucumber beetle is spreading that. So you're caught, you you have to either manage that with um, insecticide for the, you have to manage it on the vector side, so the, the, the cucumber beetle. Um, so that's where, you know, putting the, the row covers over it or anything like that. Um, you do want to make sure that you don't apply any of your sulfur fungicides to, uh, to your cucurbits. It's going to cause some, it's going to cause a, a toxic re reaction to it. Um, they're very sensitive to that sulfur sprayed onto the leaves. Legumes, it's, um, check my time. Uh, so on legumes, these are our beans and peas. Um, really the big, our bigger issues are going to be here with the annual leaf spots and our anthracnose. Uh, you know, these are going to be our, our big issues across here. Um, I don't know if I've seen as much of the, the, the rhizoctonia root rot, stem rot, uh, except for where people have planted beans year after year after year. Uh, you really want to, again, rotating those out. These are going to kind of be moved on some of the wind, wind and insects. Um, so just trying to make sure that you're staying, you're doing as much cleaning and, and, and sanitation, uh, getting a little bit better air space, spacing through those as much as possible. Um, bacterial disease as well, um, with your, some of your bacterial blight on, on, on a lot of bacterial blights, uh, you'll see, start seeing a yellow halo. You see here on the beans, you, this is a strong one on that bacterial blight, even on the halo blight, you get these kind of more faint on it, or you kind of get, or on the beans, instead of being a yellow halo, it's kind of a, it almost looks like it's a wetter, darker ring of halo around it. Uh, we call that water soaked. because it almost kind of looks like somebody has shoved water inside of it, or like, Similar to when if they, the foliage gets, this, this material gets frozen, it kind of gets kind of limp and, and, and mushy. It's that similar kind of effect. Um, again, th these, are, these are all kind of common, common bacterial diseases to keep an eye out for. Again, space plants, you try to get the airflow. Uh, on legumes, um, 
you want to limit as uh, limit the amount of nitrogen you apply to it. You don't want to apply too much there. Um, ideally, if you haven't had, if this is a new garden that hasn't had beans in the last several years, uh, apply it, it's, you're better to apply the inoculant that you can apply to it. There's a bacterial inoculant that will be a symbiote with the, the, the bean and pea roots, and it'll actually uh, fix nitrogen out of the air to be nitrogen fertilizer for the plant. Um, you're better off doing that than, than applying nitrogen fertilizer to it. Uh, mulching, again, that's going to provide that barrier between it. Um, any trellising, uh, especially uh, young and dry beans, you know, anything that you can get that, that, to dry out those things, that's all this is we're working on here. Uh, you want to make sure that you are harvesting often. Um, and and har when you're harvesting, you want to be careful, especially if you're not harvesting the whole plant, you're trying to do multiple harvests off a plant. Uh, you want to make sure that you're harvesting carefully. Don't just start ripping, tearing, and moving everything through the through the shrub, the, the bushes and the vines, um, you're going to create new wounds and new opportunities for those, for those diseases to get in. Um, and this is just a quick table, you know, depending on which disease you have, depending on which um, fungicide, which chemical active ingredient you might be looking for. Uh, again, if you're not sure, if there's any kind of question on it, um, I would definitely check with your, your local county agent. Uh, leafy greens. Um, these are honestly, I don't. I've had less issue of disease issues with with our leafy greens, um, at least in a home garden setting. Uh, you know, botrytis leaf blight, botrytis crown rot. This is typically going to be something that's going to happen early in the season. Under it, it, once it gets, I want to say eighty five or ninety degrees, it's that this, this this fungus actually goes dormant. So once we start getting warmer temperatures, um, this disease goes dormant. It, it needs a lot of high moisture content. So again, anything you try to get the air down, uh, damping off. Again, this is similar to the the uh, other diseases we saw. The other damping off in the squash, it comes along right at that soil line. So making sure that you're getting looking at the back of that seed packet to see what temperature it recommends to. Uh, to, germ to sow and germinate these plants at, try to aim for that as much as possible. That's gonna optimize these plants to, to germinate and grow as quickly as possible. Because once they get it to that, get a full true leaf out, um, and not this, these little cotyledons, these are the seed leaves, the cotyledons. Uh, once they get the full true leaf, they're, lot, they're gonna be more, mostly resistant to this uh, damping off. Um, there is a, a, a lettuce downy mildew. I'm not sure I've ever seen that around here on lettuce or any, any other leafy greens, um, not a huge issue as well. Um, if you know you've had issues with the bacterial, any bacterial diseases or downy mildew, um, that's where really your best bet is to start looking at the resistant varieties. It's gonna overwinter in the soil. So again, uh, planting the resistant varieties, you're kind of removing that susceptible host from the, that equation. Again, get those weeds out. You're not, you're having less competition, less the, um, not only less competition, but also less uh, pathogen reserve. So these, some of these weeds can be alternative uh, are also hosts for diseases. So if you can get rid of those diseases, those weeds, some of these weeds, you're going to, you're not going to have that. You're going to remove that pathogen from the equation there. Um, last, you know, if, if all these other things still don't work, um, you know, uh, applications with copper are, could be, could be there as well. Again, with all these diseases, um, you know, I've, 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 giving you some ideas of some of the, the chemical applications. Really, even if you're, if you're not doing these other prevention and cultural controls for it, you're still, even if you just, if you try to just limit yourself on just a chemical application, you're not gonna get satisfactory control with it. You really make sure, make sure that you are doing kind of a, you need to try to do, control and manage diseases on a multiple, fr multiple fronts at the same time. Um, it can seem a little overwhelming, um, but it's just one of those things, it's just kind of one thing at a time, just kind of look at these, you know, keeping these di different things under control uh, in mind as you're going through. Um, once you kind of get your, you, you know, taking out care of the, the, the diseases that you've had in the past. Um, nice thing with backyard gardens is the fact that we're typically not beholden to it. So if, uh, you know, we're not having diseases, it, we're, our livelihood is typically is not based on you know what are grown in the backyard. So if you have a crop failure, it's not the end of the world. You can always go to the farmer's market, the grocery store and buy, buy the produce instead. Learn from that and then look, move on from it, figure out, get it diagnosed. And then we can try to figure out how we can, can control it the next time. Um, so again, 
overall, you know, make sure that you're moving last year's debris and composting that either or deep, deep, tilling that deep into the soil. So that's at least 12 down, inches down in the soil. Um, this is the biggest thing there is, is if there's any disease, uh, plant diseases on it, you wanna make sure you're removing that off. Um, any, anything you remove, any of, of, of the end of the year season's debris, if you compost it, you wanna make sure that that compost does not go back onto your vegetable garden. Go put that compost onto your, 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 your flowers and your trees or something. Um, our compost bins don't get hot enough to kill the pathogens, so they'll overwinter in the compost instead. And then it'll just be spreading the, the, disease, the diseases back across the garden instead. And that kind of removes the whole point of you know, rotating in sanitation. Uh, again, do whatever you can to keep that, those, that foliage and the plants dry as possible. You know, increase sp spacing if you need, or at least get them pruned uh, a little wider, a little bit better airflow. Irrigate, you know, keep the keep the irrigation water off it. Put that mulch down. Um, you know, and kind of scout for it on a regular basis. Um, both with with pretty much we any pests garden pests we have, whether that's weeds, insects, or diseases, a lot of problems can be headed off by scouting on a regular basis. Just go look. You know, on a daily basis, just go take a, a, a quick stroll, five, 10 minutes through your garden, look for anything, pull any, you know, grab a hoe or something, grab a hoe and chop any weeds as they're still young, pick off any insects, uh, pull off any plant, any, any diseased leaves, and just kind of put them in a bucket and take them out of the garden. That's going to stop a lot of, slow a lot of diseases and insects and weed problems down. Um, so with that, I've got, that's the end of my slides. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to try to entertain any.